I want to start off with a news flash. Breaking news. This is actually this breaking news back in 2017 in July. Science has dis disproved a major biblical event. It was an article by Dr. Richard Dawkins. Some of you know who he is. He is one of the most anti-biblical, anti-Christ um, atheists in existence. He writes tons of books. He does so many talk shows and speaking in various universities all over the world and giving his two cents, which um, actually doesn't really amount to much. Because this one, in July of 2017, there was a paper uh, published in the American Journal of Human Genetics that shows that shows that modern Lebanese people, people in Lebanon today, show um, that 90% of their genetic material is um, with ancient Canaanites. That the Lebanese that we have today actually can trace their ancestry, 90% of them, all the way back to the Canaanites. Now you might be saying, okay, what's the big deal there? Richard Dawkins states, the Bible reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people. So according to him, he says the Bible says that all the Canaanites were wiped out. There are no Canaanites. And because there's no Canaanites, uh, there's no way they could be the ancestors of the people in Lebanon today. This made news. I mean, almost anything this guy says makes news. So he and others started to use this information to declare that the Bible is a myth. Because, he says, the Canaanites were not destroyed. Present-day Canaanites are still around. They're the Lebanese people, 90% of them. The problem is Darwin does not read his Bible very carefully. Or Dawkins, I'm sorry. Does not read his Bible very, very carefully. Because the Bible never says that the Hebrew people annihilated all of the Canaanites. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Because we're going to take a look at some passages in Scripture. Now what he's talking about is Joshua coming in in a conquest and annihilating all the people. All the Canaanites who were living there, that he, the, uh, the Hebrew people came in and wiped them out. That is not true. For look at what Joshua chapter 6, verse 25 says. But Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. You know the story of Jericho and Rahab, or Rahab, the prostitute, saving what happens to her? Was she annihilated and all of her family? No. She believed in the true God. She denied her Canaanite gods, came over, and actually becomes um, a member of the Hebrew people. Matter of fact, if you follow uh, David's genealogy, this was somebody in David's genealogy. If you keep going, then it goes all the way to Jesus. Jesus has in his ancestry, Rahab, this uh, prostitute. Canaanites were not destroyed. Let's look at another one real quick. In Joshua chapter 15, 63. But the Jebusites, we talked about them yesterday, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites dwelled in the land or in the people with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Thus, they were not all wiped out. We look at Joshua chapter 16, verse 10. It reads, however, they did not drive out the Canaanites, talking about the Hebrew people who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim, one of the tribes, to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. So they weren't wiped out. They were actually made to do forced labor. And as you keep reading the Bible, people intermarried with them. Joshua chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Yet the people of Manasseh, one of the other tribes, could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Notice that? Did not utterly drive them out. And as we know, if you keep reading the Bible, they intermarried, many of them, with the Hebrew people. So we keep seeing these kind of examples and stuff that we have here. And the whole article that um, Dawkins uses is saying, they were wiped out. Look at Judges chapter 1, verses 27 to 33. Listen to how many times the Canaanites are mentioned. Now, this is after Joshua's conquest. This is the period of the Judges. The Canaanites are still around because it reads in 27, the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. 
So the Canaanites lived among them. The Asherites among, lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they didn't drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anna, Anath, I'm sorry. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Dawkins uses this article, this genetic test, uh, our publication, this um, research paper, to tell people, and people are swallowing this hook, line, and stinker, that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate, that there's errors in the Bible, scientific errors. Yet, if you read the Bible carefully, you'll see the Canaanites were never wiped out. And thus, of course, they're going to be able to find their DNA and ancestors in the Middle East to this day. It makes perfect sense. It's not an error in the Bible. The guy just doesn't study his Bible very carefully. He picks pieces of his Bible haphazardly, tries to find something that doesn't fit uh, with the Bible, a scientific paper or something like this. Then he goes on the attack and attacking the Bible. So anyway, but in this lesson, what we're going to be doing tonight, we're going to examine some scientific topics, different disciplines of science, and we're going to see how they disagreed with the Bible. I've mentioned a couple of these throughout the week already, but how science at major universities all around the world stated things as fact, which was contrary to the Bible, only to find out the Bible was right and the science was wrong. Happens frequently. Ugh. So let's take a look at some of these. Let's begin with astronomy. If you noticed at nighttime, the constellations here, it's beautiful. And if you look up that way, you got uh, Key Largo, which is pretty bright. And then beyond that is um, uh, Miami and stuff. And if you go looking down, down that way, it's pitch dark. And in the nighttime, you'll see that it's all lit up, and that's Marathon. But right where we're at, we got pretty good. There's very little light pollution right above us here, so we can see things. Well, science, here's the science error I want to point out in astronomy that science taught. Science taught for centuries, for centuries, that the stars could be counted. As a matter of fact, they used to state, in all universities, they used to state there were only 1,026 stars. How did they come up with that? There was a guy named Ptolemy who um, lived right around the time of Christ. But the thing is, Ptolemy, I, I don't know the whole story, but I think he must have got some Chinese or something like that, put a blanket out one night on a cool night, laid down, eating a Chinese, looking up the stars, and started counting them. But anyway, he published a little booklet thing, and it was used for centuries. People did not question it. You know what the Bible says, though? In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22, and I'm going to read this one out of the God's Word translation to make it a little more clear. I will multiply the descendants of my servant David and the Levites who serve me like the stars of the heaven that cannot be counted and the sand of the seashore that cannot be measured. God is telling us right there, you're not going to be able to go out here and count the sand on the seashore. Why is that true? If you were paying attention yesterday at aquarium encounters, you found out that parrotfish actually bite off pieces of coral. They grind it up to eat the organic things, the worms, the algaes, and stuff in there. They grind it up with their back teeth, with their parrot beak. They bite off, grind it up, and they poop out sand. And one parrotfish, an adult parrotfish, can make about 1,000 pounds of sand in one year. The sand is constantly being made. Plus, you have seashells, we're going to talk about tomorrow, that in many beaches around the world, they get the, the animal dies, their skeleton washes up, and wave erosion just keeps breaking them down. It turns into sand. If you want a really cool treat, go over to the Bahamas. Go to the island of Eleuthera, which means freedom. You go to Eleuthera, and there are pink beaches there. Because of seashells that were pink in color have been ground up by nature, just the erosion and stuff, and the beaches are pink in color. You can see that. But you can't count the seashore, sands of the seashore, because it's constantly being added to. The stars, you cannot count the stars. Matter of fact, until really we put the space, the Hubble Space Telescope up there, they had no idea how many really stars there were. When they put that up there and they turned it on, they were amazed. Astronomers and scientists were amazed at how many stars there were. There are so many stars, I mean, they can't be counted. It's exactly what the Bible says. Um, God's word says it's immeasurable. Scientists estimate today that there's over 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. 
Matter of fact, now they put up another space telescope, and they're finding even more. It seems to be endless going out there, which is what God said. Wow. God told Jeremiah this 2,400 years ago, and it's still a fact to this day. So, the Bible is correct. Science was wrong. Look at another one having to do with the universe. Science used to teach for centuries that the universe was contained that it had its limits. It could only go so far, and you'd reach the edge of it, or the, the envelope of it. That's not what the Bible says. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 37, this is the uh, English standard, thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be explored, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel. He's saying, I'm never going to remove Israel. I'm always Israel's always going to be dear to me. And to prove that, he says, that you can't count the heavens. If the heavens can't be measured, I'm not going to do this. In other words, you can't measure the universe. And what we keep finding, well, it's a guy by the name of, um, well, I think it was Hubble, who actually discovered that the universe is actually expanding. By the way, this guy was a Christian. And he found out that the universe is expanding. Now, we have this big bang. Now, think about this for a second. If there was a big bang and a bang explodes, as time goes on, it should be slowing down, correct? But Hubble found out that's not exactly what's going on. What's going on, the expansion is increasing. That goes against the laws of physics, as we know it here on this planet. But it is exactly what God said. So the universe is, as far as we can see, it cannot be measured. Again, Jeremiah lived 600 years before Christ. And, and all ancient cultures at that time, when Jeremiah wrote this, all ancient cultures believed that the universe could be measured. Yet God's word stood alone to saying, no, it can't. You guys are wrong. Conclusion, Bible is correct. Science is wrong. Let's go to another field. Meteorology. I'll tell you, I've had a lot of fun with meteorology um, topics and stuff like that. i got to tell you, I'm going to digress here for just a second, but this is really funny. And you guys look like you need a laugh. Many years ago, um, in the early 1990s, I was teaching at school, and I had a student. His name was Richard. I don't remember his last name. Richard took me for biology first first uh, year in, in high school, and he failed. I mean, he failed, failed, failed. Like about a 40, 50%. I mean, he failed. So because biology one is required, he took it again to graduate. Still failed. Didn't make any difference whatsoever. Junior year, he takes it again. Still didn't increase the score. <laughs> the guy failed a third time. Now he's a senior. He's got to pass this or he's going to have to go to summer school. So he's taking it again. And throughout the year, he's doing absolutely terrible. He's not passing. He's got like about a 46 or uh, a 40% or something like that. It was really, really or maybe it was 50, something like that. It was really low. Well, Richard was sort of a, I mean, the guy wasn't dumb or anything. He just did not try. He did not exert himself. And as I told you before, God put us on this planet to create things, to do things, to be creative. He wasn't. His brain was just sitting in idle all the time. He, had, he never did work. He never filled out stuff, never turned in homework, quizzes, tests, or anything. He never studied anything. You'd think, though, after four years, he'd start improving, but he still didn't. Well, he was a prankster, though, to a degree. But one day, I had um, cafeteria duty. And yes, I probably had my bag of chocolate chips and my can of Coke and walked outside because it was a beautiful day. Spring day, everybody's outside. It was an early spring. And I'm walking outside in the front of the school. There's some big oak trees and stuff there. And I look over the side, and everybody's just sitting around the trees and on the grass and stuff. There was a Dairy Queen across the street and stuff. But we had all this. I look over here, over to the side where nobody's around. There's a bike rack, and here's Richard sitting down on the ground, taking the cap off of the air tires, the, the tires, and with a pencil or a pen or something, he was pushing the valve in there to flatten all the tires. He was just going right down the roads like this. His back was to me. I'm like, oh, boy. I go walking over quietly, and now I'm standing right behind him, and as he moves from one to the other, then he notices my feet there. And he looks up, and I go, yeah, you're caught. 
And he goes, okay, let's go inside. I know the routine. So we went in to write him a detention, and we did. And I remember asking, I said, why were you doing it? Was, are you mad at somebody? He says, I don't know who those are. <laughs> like, oh, boy. That week, he had to serve a detention to 5 o'clock, from after school to 5 o'clock. I pulled the detention duty that week. So I'm sitting in my classroom, and he was the only one in there. And I got to sit with him till 5 o'clock. So the thing is, I had him in class. He, I know he has homework. And he's just sitting there at his desk. And just looking all around. I said, Richard, why don't you do your homework? I, 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 what homework? Well, at least do the homework I gave you for class. You got me here to help you with it. Why don't you do And he's like, oh, no, no thanks. Why? I, I'm going to fail anyway. I'm failing right now. Why should I spend more time doing this? I'm going to fail. Well, that disturbed me a little bit. But then as we continued to discuss this, and it was, it was a friendly discussion. I wasn't yelling at him or anything. All of a sudden, he said, that I've taken this class like four times now, and I can't pass it. I don't understand my life. He says, I'm a total waste. I think that the cells making up my body, Michael, are like this, um, just a waste of biological material. And he says, I don't even see a reason that I should continue living because I can't succeed at anything. Now, when that happens, red flags go off. And I'm like, okay, am I going to have to call the counseling department now, Kathleen Price and stuff, and call all these people? And But I thought, okay, I'm... It's getting serious, and he's really going down quick here. And, and I thought, all right, all right, this is what we're going to do. I'm so, okay, Richard, so you think you can't do anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm super dumb. I said, Richard, you're not dumb. You just don't fly yourself. And he says, well, there's no way I can pass. I said, yeah, you can. You can still pass the course. Um, I mean, you're not going to get no A, but you could probably get a D if you really try. You can still pass. And he says, no, I can't do that. I can't get that high of a grade to get in there. And... As he sat there and we're talking back and forth, I, I said, I could sense he was really getting desperate at this point. And I said to him, Richard, you got like what, about a 50%? We'll just say, I don't know, it's 48, 50% or whatever. And he says, yeah. And I said, see, you're not dumb. You, get, you can get these things. You just don't try. You just don't put any effort into things. And I said, you know something? I see in you, Richard, having a career that people will want to listen to what you have to say. I think people will even set their clocks and their schedules by what you would have to tell them. I believe people will go out of their way to listen to you tell them things. And he's like, right, right. No one wants to listen to me. I said, Richard, you have the makings of being a TV weatherman. And he's like, what? I only got like a 48%. I go, true. But do you know any TV weatherman that is that accurate? <laughs> this is a true story. And he sat there and he thought, I don't think they are. I said, see, you're light years ahead of them. <laughs> he passed the course. The last I heard, I've lost track of him years and years ago. Um, but I, I know he was going to college to study meteorology. God has a lot to say. I need to get you guys to laugh. Some of you are still sitting there like, you don't, what's a meteorologist? <laughs> type thing. <laughs> Trying to get some life out of you here. Gee. Well, science used to teach, and there's a lot of problems with uh, science has with meteorology. One science era was science used to teach that wind the wind that we feel blowing, like when we got here and we felt like we are in the land of Oz, um, all the wind that was going, they used to say that wind moves at random in an unorganized pattern. That wind would just blow this direction one day, this direction that way. Some days it's not blowing at all. Other days it's blowing really hard. There was no organized thing to it. Yet, that's not what the Bible says. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 6, we read, The wind blows to the south, goes around to the north, Around and around goes the wind on its circuit. Circuit. In other words, pattern. The wind returns. 
The ancient Hebrew writing here is actually talking about circuits, a pattern and organized plan. That the wind is not blowing at random, it is going in a pattern. And as I told you in the very first lesson, winds have certain patterns to them. And the thing is, this is exactly what the Bible says. Though science for centuries said it didn't. God told Solomon this around 950 BC, that air is actually moving on a course, that the movement is on a circuit, and today we now know that it's absolutely correct. If you sit and you watch weather maps and TV weathermen, you'll see how the wind, they, they can see it up in the north woods. We're way, uh, watching what's happening up in northern uh, northwestern Canada because that's what was coming our way. Now, you know, down around the Milwaukee area, you're looking over to the, to the west to see what's coming because things move in a circuit. We know this now. Thus, the Bible was correct. Science was wrong. Not only that, another one that science had totally wrong was that air has weight. You know, for centuries they said air doesn't weigh anything. I remember when I was teaching elementary school years and years ago, this was in the 1980s, and I was teaching a concept with a bunch of elementary kids, and I was trying to explain to them that air has a weight to it. There's weight to air. Like, matter of fact, I even had a beaker, just an empty looking beaker sitting on my desk. And I asked the kids what's in there. Most of the kids are saying, nothing, nothing. Kids even coming up, look, I don't see anything in there. I said, there's something in there. They're looking all over. Finally, somebody says, there's air in there. Very good. They got a sticker. And <laughs> but there's air. And I said, now air has a weight. And I remember some of the kids, I don't feel any weight. So what I did is I took a meter stick, tied it to a thing in the ceiling with a string right in the middle so it's sitting level. Put it right at the 50 centimeter mark and it's sitting here totally balanced and level. Then I cut two pieces of string all in front of them. They're all sitting here watching to see what I'm doing. Uh, this was spur of the moment. This was not planned. I took out uh, some more kite string and I cut exactly the same length and I had two identical balloons um, that were in my desk. And so I tied each balloon to one end of the string and I put it at one centimeter from either side to the end on the bal or on this thing now. And I showed them it's perfectly balanced. Then I said, and they're like, so, now watch. Untie one, take it off, <laughs> blew it up really big, tied it in a knot, tied it back on the string, put it on there. Guess what happened? And I remember one of the kids saying, that's magic. Yeah. Air has weight. The Bible says this. In Job chapter 28, verse 25, we read, when he gave the wind its weight and appointed to the waters by measure. The wind has weight. We use this in, if you watch a weather forecast, you see the uh, metabolic pressure, the weight of the air. We have this. Air has pressure to it. It has a weight to it. It's a mass. As I told you before, it has different gases and stuff. There is, it's, it's there. So the Bible was absolutely correct in this because it says that it has a weight. By the way, the Hebrew word there for weight is the Hebrew word mishkal. Mishkal means literally to put something on a balance and weigh it. That's what the Hebrew word means. Thus, the Bible is correct. Science was wrong. Here's another one. Oh, this was a kicker. When I researched this one, I was almost laughing sometimes. They used, science used to teach for centuries that rain and snow just appeared, fell down to the earth, and then it just disappeared. That people walking to class would walk over stone pavement. After a rainstorm, there's puddles there. After the class, they come back out. The sun's out. There's no water. You go into class the next day, ask, hey, prof, remember it was raining yesterday and there were puddles out there? Yeah. After class, there was no, no puddles out there. Where'd the water go? It just ceased to exist. That's what they used to say, though. It just ceased to exist. It's gone. Really? That's not what the Bible says. Matter of fact, I taught in a private Christian school. I taught earth science one year. And when we came to the part of meteorology, particularly about the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle, I said, put your books aside. Get your Bibles out because I'm going to teach you this whole thing right out of Scripture because it's all recorded in Scripture. Yet it wasn't until just a couple hundred years ago science figured out that they were wrong. In Job, for instance, Job chapter 36, verses 27, 28, it reads, For he draws up the drops of water, okay, evaporation. They distill his mist in rain when the skies pour down 
and drop on mankind abundantly. This is talking about the water cycle. I mean, it's a very good description of it. Plus, there's other passages that go on and explain it even more. Isaiah 55.10, Ecclesiastes 1.7, Job chapter 26, verse 8, Psalm chapter 135, verse 7, Psalm 33, verse 7, Amos chapter 5, verse 8, all describe parts of the hydrologic cycle. Yet science said, no, that's not the way it is. There was no water cycle until just a couple hundred years ago. So the Bible describes this. Matter of fact, the Bible describes the hydrologic cycle better than any other, I think, probably in more detail than any other scientific phenomenon. And the thing is, it's right. In all those Bible passages from like the Old Testament stuff, it's totally correct. Conclusion, the Bible was correct. Science was wrong. Since we're down here for marine biology, I thought let's hit a couple of things on oceanography. I already told you some of this, how they used to teach on the first night I was talking about this, that the oceans they used to teach um, didn't have currents out in the deep ocean. And it was a guy that, um, his name was Matthew Morey, the father of modern oceanography. He was the one who was reading his Bible in Psalm 8, 8, where it says the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. When he read that, I told you, he said, that sounds like currents. And he got the U.S. Navy to sponsor him to go out and search, and he mapped all around the world, he mapped ocean currents. Yet that was not what the Bible was saying. Ocean currents were really unknown. The first ones that were actually listed was in 1769, and that was actually by the uncle of um, Ben Franklin, who was a merchant sailor who actually told Ben Franklin about it, and they started putting things about the Gulf Stream. We knew about that one. But it was in 1847, before the Civil War, Matthew Murray, reading his Bible, was convinced the Bible was correct, that science was wrong, got the Navy to approve it, and he did. And he published the books on oceanography. Thus, the Bible was correct, science was wrong. And as I also told you on that first lecture, they used to teach in oceanography. Matter of fact, I've still got some really old copies someplace in my house of a really old um, oceanography book. I got this when I was in college taking oceanography, and uh, I kept this because it had a thing in there that the ocean floors are flat. Really old book. This thing's over 100 years old. But science used to teach that the ocean floor was flat. They called it the abyssal plain. That between these continents, it is totally flat. Yet, Matthew Murray, reading his Bible in Jonah chapter 2, verse 5, the waters closed in over to me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. Murray says, wait a minute. There can't be mountains down there. It's supposed to be flat. Ah, okay. Science says it's flat. The Bible says there's mountains there. He goes to sea, gets the Navy board to prove it. He goes out, and sure enough, he finds out that there's mountains at the sea. You know, by the way, does anybody know what the tallest mountain on the planet is? It's not Everest. Hawaii. Hawaii. Everest, you could put, um, you can drop Everest along the base of where uh, Hawaii is. There's still over a, like a mile of water still on top of it. Everest isn't that tall. Hawaii is really tall. Anyway, that's just one of those things they put in a book. So we, again, we see Matthew Morey, he believed in his Bible more than he believed in science, and he proved the Bible was correct, science was wrong. Or let's talk about another fun one here. How about human biology and medicine? This will be interesting since we have a physician sitting here. They used to teach that blood makes you ill. Physicians used to do this until not that long ago, that if a person was very sick, they would bleed you. They would take lancets and make slices, and they would use leeches and stuff. But they thought, if you're ill, let's get rid of the bad blood. Well, the Bible says that blood is necessary for life. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 reads, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. But they taught for the longest time, if you're really sick, to bleed you. If you had certain diseases, you'd call a physician. They would come over to your house. They would make slices in you, in your arm or whatever, and they would bleed out blood. Matter of fact, I think I ran into one of those a few years ago. When I was at Fort and I had an accident with an axe during one of our breakfasts, a lumberjack breakfast, I had a big, heavy axe dressed up as a lumberjack and walked out to the, to the area to let everybody have their breakfast. And I'm talking about the history of the logging industry 
it's a six page monologue. We get out there and I'm finishing up my talk. And as I've got this ax, it's my own personal ax. It's very sharp. And as I'm talking, as you guys know, I talk with my hands. I'm standing there and I'm talking and I'm just using my hands as I'm talking about how the logging industry was dying out um, the old way and now the modern thing. But I'm talking, I'm using my hands back and forth like this. Without realizing it, I had the ax in this hand. And as I was talking like this, I felt my right hand hit the metal part of the ax. But I just thought I hit it. And I just kept, I'm like as close as I am to y'all. I have 40 people sitting here, about the size of this group, a little bit more. And I'm sitting here and I just keep talking and blood is flying all over. Because what I did, I sliced the whole back of my hand from my index finger back across. You can see the scar. It's still here all the way across, and blood is flying everywhere. Now, the people who are sitting closest to me, they thought for, everybody saw this, they thought I was playing a joke. They thought, thought I had ketchup packets in my hand and were squirting the ketchup out as blood. I'm going on, and they're all like, no, nobody was laughing. They're just sitting there looking, and their mouths were just in awe. What's, what's going on? And I was like, wow, they're really into this ending. Man. <laughs> These people are just just loving this. So because of that, I went a little longer. Finally, I stopped and I put my, my hand down when I was done with my talk and I put my hand down. Then I felt, all of a sudden I realized my hand has warm fluid running down it. And I look, my hand is covered in blood. The tissue is pulled back. I can see right in there. And I was like, uh, and I'm standing, my shoes are covered in blood. My pant legs are, there's blood all around me. Everybody's sitting there. And I look and I go, uh, excuse me, I've had an accident. <laughs> There's a guy standing over here cooking the breakfast, cooking bacon. His name was um, uh, Jim Fleming. He's now dead, but a um, very dear friend of mine. And Vietnam veteran, but he can't look at blood. And he was the one standing there, and there was a, a college student who was standing next to him. Sarah Pritchard was standing right next to him, helping him cook the bacon. And I said, um, Jim, he's busy cooking. He's not paying attention to me. I said, Jim, uh, I need a paper towel. Oh, okay. <laughs> he gets a roll of bounty, pulls up one paper towel, comes walking over, and he starts to hand. He goes, oh. And I go, actually, Jim, I'm going to need more than one. <laughs> Sarah Pritchard sees this, and she had just finished a first responder course, and she did a great job. She saw this, came running over, looked at it, and she goes, I know what to do. I know what to do. And she took off running down to the dining hall, to find the EMT in camp, leaving me bleeding <laughs> there in the forest. And I was like, I, Sarah, Sarah, it's okay, it's okay. Well, she's gone. I'm left now with Jim, who can't look at blood. And I have a red handkerchief in my back pocket. And I said, I'm holding my hand up like this. And I said, Jim, take take my handkerchief, wad it up. And he did. He says, tell me what to do. I said, just wad the thing up. I, and then I put my hand down. He's trying to do this. I said, put the thing on here, and I said, tie it really tight. I got a long walk back. I got like, a, you know, three quarter of a mile walk here from Cranberry Point all the way back to where my car is. So I'm going to drive myself to the hospital. I excuse myself. I'm sorry for if I spoiled anybody's dinner or breakfast here. I start walking back. As I get down by the beach, here comes Sarah, running from the dining hall with Steve Seifer, our EMT. Steve's got this big body bag, or not body bag, this big. Um, emergency bag of all of his fire equipment stuff. He's chair of uh, the chief of fire department. And so he's got that and he's got a board, a, um, a board to put me on. And he's running. <laughs> and they come up there and I go, Sarah, where'd you go? She says, well, I went to get Steve. And I go, I don't need a, a, a backboard or anything. <laughs> I'm just going to go to the hospital. So Steve says, this is what you ran me. I thought you cut off his hand or something. <laughs> So he, Steve started to look at, and he says, no, it's bandaged, okay, just go straight to the hospital. And I said, that's what I'm doing. He says, you can't drive. I said, I still got one good hand. So I got there. Now, the point of the story is we're getting to it. <laughs> when I got to the hospital, they had somebody else drive me to the hospital, go into the emergency room. Now, Seth, you're going to love this. I don't, maybe this is, I, I hope this is foreign to you. As I walked in there, first of all, I'm holding my hand up, and I got a red handkerchief. And my hand is like, I've got my fingers down, and I'm holding pressure. I walk in there. They see me at the desk. There's nobody around. I come walking up to the emergency room, um, up to the, the window of the nurses where they do the triage. And before I even got there, they saw me, and they get up, and they come running. They go, oh, oh, do you have the fingers? Do you have the fingers? 
Yeah. Where are they? Do you have them on ice? No. You're supposed to keep them on ice. Where are your fingers? You got them on your body? I said, yeah. Where are they? On my hand. <laughs> I said, I just cut the back of my hand. It's not that bad. So they took me in the triage. Doctor was called in. They took me. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Seth, I'd love to hear your opinion on this one. They brought me in. The doctor comes in eventually. He looks at it. It's still bleeding profusely. He tells the nurse, go down to the lab and get a one liter beaker. Puzzled me. The nurse looks at him puzzled as well. She goes down to the lab. A few minutes later, she comes back with a clean one liter beaker. He has now taken some objects and towels and stuff and he's stacked them up and he puts my hand like this and he puts the beaker underneath there. And he said, this was an ax wound, right? I said, yeah. How old is the ax? I thought it was my dad's. It's very old. And he goes, oh, but I said, I keep it very sharp. It's very clean. And he goes, uh-huh. And when the nurse is standing here, he says, okay, um, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tell me when he gets to um, about 500 liters, milliliters, come and tell me, and then I'll, I'll treat it. I never heard of that. But that much, 500, I mean, how much have I already lost in all of this? But, well, she went and got him, took him forever to come back. I'm still bleeding. He comes back. He just pours peroxide all over the thing. And um, then he said, yeah, you're going to need some stitches. Duh. <laughs> and he did a terrible job stitching, which if you look at the scar, you can see. But um, then uh, he wrote me a prescription and told me to go get some antibiotics and stuff at Walmart. And when I got to Walmart, I, I was, I, I don't know how much I lost, but I was feeling very queasy and tired very lethargic, where normally blood like that doesn't bother me. Ask my wife. Stuff like that doesn't faze me. But I sat down because they said, we'll take about 20, 30 minutes to get this filled at the pharmacy. And I couldn't sit in the chair. I just kept sliding out of the chair like a cartoon onto the floor. And, but yeah, bleeding. Oh, let's, yeah, I know to let the thing bleed to get, let the blood cleanse the wound and stuff like that. But that was a honking a lot of blood. I mean, that's a whole pint of blood there. Yeah, that's a half hour drive. I don't know how much, but I was not feeling good. We'll just say it that way. And I went home and, yeah, I, I tried to come back to work. They wouldn't let me. So, anyway, until the 1600s, people didn't understand the blood flowed through the body and vessels carried by nutrients. We talked about the um, closed circulatory systems and stuff. It was William Harvey, I was trying to think of that name the other night, who actually proved that blood is connected with capillaries and stuff, and it flows through the body. But they didn't know what blood was. Now we know blood nourishes our cells, takes away waste, adds oxygen and other things, does a lot of useful things. It's not something that you just get out of the person. As a matter of fact, um, using leeches or just cutting and draining blood, you're all familiar with George Washington, our founding father of our country. In his final days, just before his death, George Washington suffered from a disease they identified as bacterial infection called bacterial epiglottis. And the doctors were called to his house at Mount Vernon, and they decided, oh, um, he's got severe sore throat and stuff like this, but let's bleed him. So they bled him. And then a few hours later, they went back. He wasn't any better, so they bled him some more. Still wasn't better. They go back. They bleed him more. They ended up draining 35% of this blood out of his body. Just the doctors did this. And then he died. Really? <laughs> um, he was sick, and they took that much blood out. Today we know if somebody's in an emergency or something like this, in an accident, get blood in them. Blood's so important. We need to get blood. Science now realizes that blood is indeed life. But the Bible was correct. Science was wrong for centuries. That's another one. Um, another one. Science often teaches that various races of humans descending from various other early primates and stuff like this, uh, from early ancestors. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, I'm going to Matthew, not Genesis, Matthew 19, 4, um, we read, this is Jesus speaking, who is God. Have you not read that he, God, who created them from the beginning, made them male and female? It wasn't through a process of different animals evolving through random chance mutations, adding that new genetic information to the genome. That doesn't do it. God created them this way. And 
That's what it says in that passage. Also, you can go to Genesis 3.20. You can go to Acts 17.26. You can go to 1 Corinthians 15.45. You can go to um, and look at other passages and stuff. But the thing is, God created them. So they apparently did not evolve over millions of years. Well, the Bible states that God created just two individuals, and we are descended from those two. And then there was the, the flood, and which wiped out most of everybody except one family. And so we are descendants of that family. Anyway, in the 1990s, the world was shocked by an article published in the respected science, very respected science publication called Science, stating that we were all descendant from one female. Every single human on the planet has been traced back genetically using mitochondrial DNA that we all came from one female. To give her a name, they had to call her something, and sort of a joke, it was more or less. They called her mitochondrial Eve. You can read about it. I've given you the articles where this was picked up, Science, uh, in January of 1998, and in Nature Genetics also in 1997. They had the article also. This was published a number of times. And what they came up with, actually, science, the first article had the dating wrong because they were trying to date the uh, mitochondrial Eve using ordinary DNA. That's not what they were using. They were using mitochondrial DNA. The mutation rates are different than for uh, the linear DNA. So they had the wrong thing. Many genetics, geneticists, we caught this thing right away when we were reading the paper. They're using the wrong, wrong thing. That's where you see these other publications coming along later on, like Nature Genetics. They said, no, you used the wrong date and stuff. They estimated that mitochondrial Eve lived probably around 6,500 years ago, give or take maybe a couple hundred years or something like that. This fits very close to what the Bible says. And so we all came from one. By the, by the way, National Geographic, not long after that, decided to do one on the Y chromosome that males have, and we found out that all males on the planet came from one common ancestor. Not from various ape-like creatures. Matter of fact, I was reading this morning, um, after our session, I went back and I picked up my phone, and there was an article there um, about how um, we evolved um, from Neanderthals and from other groups and stuff, and they're talking about these early ancestors. That's not what, what science really shows. That is really hypothesizing a lot. They're making a lot of guesses. The conclusion is the Bible was correct. Science was wrong. And there's more we could go on. You can go to our website. We have a whole series on science in the Bible, but you can check out more on that. But the point is I'm making... Whenever science says something definitive and it goes against the Bible, be extremely cautious. They have a track record that is absolutely terrible. I mean, there's so many other things we could talk about. Science constantly makes mistakes, and they're constantly having to fix it. Yet the Bible, as old as it is, has everything in place. I mean, if you really want to study something fun, I'll give you a project to do. Study the Mosaic Health Code. That's the health code given by God to Moses, it's found in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Looking at the health code, it is remarkable because it is still in use today because it's so accurate. This is before we knew about viruses. This thing dates back to um, 1400 BC, 1450 BC. It's still so accurate. It has things like how to sterilize things in fire. In labs, we still do that. Um, it talks about don't take, um, uh, I almost said a crap. Well, I will. <laughs> I just said it. <laughs> don't take a crap in the middle of your campground. God tells him in Deuteronomy, no, if you're going to go to the bathroom, take a shovel, go outside of camp, so many, so many cubits way outside of camp, dig a hole, go to the bathroom, then cover it back up, come into camp. How many diseases, how many people, millions of people have died from bad sanitation, yet if they follow the Mosaic Health Code, they do well. Matter of fact, in New York State, I was reading in Reader's Digest a couple of years ago, sitting in a doctor's office, an article that in New York State, Jews that follow the Mosaic Health Code get a deduction on their life insurance and medical insurance because they know you're going to live longer, or your chances are you're going to live longer because this code is so perfect. How did Moses in 1450 B.C. come up with something like that? Because he got it from God. We would like to thank the falling gold and silver sponsors of the 2024 Marine Biology Trip who made this ministry possible. Marvin Joyce Husson, the Bojar family, Michael and Denise Lane, Jonah and Naomi Van Peterson, 
The Han Family, Stitch It Custom Embroidery and So Much More, Tori and Coco Wildlife Real Estate, and Arizona Tea. You can learn more about sponsorships at evansforfaith.org slash marinebiology or use the links in the description. 